This is Law Bites, a podcast with Michael Geist. On Wednesday, the House of Representatives passed a bill that could ban TikTok in the United States if the popular app does not separate from its Chinese parent company, ByteDance. The vote was bipartisan and overwhelming, even after TikTok lobbied aggressively against the bill and summoned its millions of viewers to speak out against it. So with cross currents of national security, the mental health of young Americans, and even presidential politics, what is the future of TikTok? New legislation making its way through the U.S. Congress has placed a TikTok ban back on the public agenda. The bill, which as you just heard, would lead to either a divestiture or a ban of the app, has passed the House of Representatives and is now headed to the Senate. On the Canadian front, TikTok is already prohibited on government devices at the federal level alongside some provinces. The government has quietly conducted a national security review and there are new calls to ban it altogether from the Canadian market. Anupam Chander is a law professor at Georgetown University and a leading expert on the global regulation of new technologies. He joined me on the podcast several years ago when a TikTok ban was raised by the Trump administration, and he returns now to discuss the latest developments and their broader implications. Anupam, welcome to the podcast. Thanks very much, Michael. Honored to be here. Uh, well, I, it's great to have you back in this case, you know, back in 2020. You joined me on the podcast to talk about a proposed TikTok ban from the Trump administration. At the time, it felt like this was a Trump thing, but it, it turns out, I think, that it's it's not. And you, at that time, raised some significant concerns about the plan. Here we are about three and a half years later, different administration, different Congress, but some of the same kinds of issues are, are coming up again. Uh, I'd like to, I'll get to the bill or we can get to the bill that just passed the House in a little bit. But before we do that, can you talk a little bit about some of these developments over the last number of years? There's clearly been mounting political concern with TikTok. In Canada, we had app ban, an app ban on government devices. And in this instance, we're seeing bipartisan support, some really strange bedfellows, so to speak, uh, for this legislative action. So, you know, what has been taking place over the last number of years that seems to have really accelerated some of the concerns? Sure. So um, it's it's really fascinating to watch all of this. Uh, uh, I also thought this was a Trump thing, and I thought the Biden administration would uh, clearly repudiate uh, the TikTok ban because it seemed to me very highly political um, that Trump was targeting TikTok because it had proven to be a thorn in his side. Um, It was the one massive social media platform in the United States that he or his followers hadn't found to be very beneficial to them. Um, And in fact, had found to be the opposite, uh, a source of ridicule and criticism. So in 2020, just a a reminder for our viewers, uh, TikTok um, had been a way to for the BTS army, uh, the kind of the aficionados of uh, the uh, K-pop uh, band uh, BTS to uh, gather to circulate information as to how to wreck a rally that Trump was hosting in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and so they shared information about how you call in and reserve a ticket for that rally for free. And you just had to give them your phone number essentially. And all the TikTokers were willing to do that to reserve a seat. When Trump actually spoke at this rally, he it was mostly empty. Um, and so, and before the rally, he said, we have a million people seeking seats. It's going to be extraordinary. I thought, well, the Biden administration certainly would not share those concerns, uh, given the politics of all that. Um, and the Biden administration came in, as you saw, as you know, and immediately withdrew uh, the TikTok ban based on the international emergency economic powers of the president uh, under a statute which goes by the name IEPA. Um, but it continued the divestiture discussion uh, that had actually begun 
in an investigation in 2019. So in 2019, um, because TikTok was formed in part by the purchase of an, another Chinese owned app in the United States, an app called Musical.ly, also based in California, um, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States had purview over that foreign investment to review it for national security uh, concerns. It begun that review in 2019, and that review continues to this day. Um, it, it resulted in an order in 2020 requiring divestment, and then TikTok challenged that order uh, in the courts, and uh, both sides stayed the, uh, agreed to stay uh, the uh, court case while they negotiated. Um, and so that court case we may well see revived now under the Biden administration if CFIUS issues an order, or if um, we may see a different kind of court case if this uh, bill that's going before the Senate uh, passes. Um, and so, so I think there's a lot um, uh, that's going on and there's been you know, remarkable developments Thanks for that. That refresher about the Tulsa rallies. Now, supporters of this kind of legislation, whether divesture or or bans and the like, and, and frankly, we see it here in Canada and we see it elsewhere, typically do focus on the privacy and security related concerns. Can can you talk a, a bit about both those concerns? And, and frankly, to your knowledge, what kind of evidentiary base is there for them? And, and I have to say that you, you could spend a lot of time reading this and you get a lot of different views with some insisting that there are some serious issues, sometimes saying that we can't tell you the details, but they're there. And others who have said, well, they don't really see a big difference between TikTok or some of the other social media services that are out there. So in 2020, we had federal judges that were presented evidence by the U.S. government to justify the TikTok bans. Uh, some of that inform information has never been revealed to the public. It's redacted in the in the uh, uh, filings um, that are made public. Um, and based on those uh, filings, the uh, what you see is the court saying that the government's argument about national security is framed in the hypothetical. It's possible that China could use this for surveillance. It's possible that perhaps China could use this for propaganda. Uh, but none of that has been demonstrated, at least uh, to in 2020. Now, there may be a different evidentiary basis today that the government has, but when Montana passed a bill banning TikTok in the state, it was only based on the public information that you and I have about TikTok. It wasn't based on some private information that Montana authorities had somehow gleaned from national security uh, uh, authorities in the United States. So my suspicion is that really we're talking in the hypothetical that this is possible um, now, don't get me wrong, I think hypotheticals are important and, you know, uh, might potentially justify action, but boy, I, is a court going to press that question when it's tested uh, because uh, of the free speech implications of a divestiture order. Even a divestiture order has enormous free speech implications uh, not just the ban. The ban has enormous free speech implications, uh, but it, even a divestiture order has enormous free speech implications because it's like saying, I don't like this publisher of this newspaper. I want a different publisher for this newspaper. The newspaper may still publish and the government can't defend itself by saying, hey, you can still write in that paper, um, the government had just insisted on the publisher being changed. That's an interesting analogy to make. You know, further to to that, TikTok has has argued 
that in, in sort of some of their public discussions that they say, listen, if this is in, in the realm of hypotheticals, we are little different than many other social media services. There are privacy issues, to be sure. There are obviously misinformation, disinformation concerns on all of these various platforms. You know, how different is TikTok other than the fact that it's it's the Chinese government as opposed to, say, the U.S. government that that may sit at the end of making demands in terms of access to certain kinds of information? So I think it's a great question. The difference, of course, is that TikTok is uh, from China um, and uh, the other platforms are from the United States. Um, but we've seen, uh, for propaganda purposes, uh, Facebook used effectively, uh, to some extent, by the Russian Internet uh, Research Agency uh, in 2016. Uh, we've seen uh, uh, employees of Twitter uh, being uh, charged and prosecuted and convicted for spying on behalf of foreign governments. Uh, there are lots of ways that platforms can be either the source of propaganda or the source of foreign surveillance other than mere ownership. Uh, and so this is a very um, uh, incomplete account of the, the risks that are involved. And my worry here is that I can tell you a risk story about TikTok, but I can also tell you a risk story about every app on your phone. Um, so if we understand, if, if, you, if you limit your analysis to would it be better if TikTok were shuttered, your uh, yes, there's no question that national security would be infinitesimally <laughs> better um, um, if you shuttered uh, TikTok. Um, but that would also be true for every other app on your phone. Uh, and so there are national security concerns that we, I can I can hypothesize with every app. Lots of apps today use Russian code inside them. Um, so Russian libraries from Yandex, um, and we don't ban uh, Yandex libraries. Uh, they are they could easily be set, sending information to Russia, um, and we're almost in a hot war with Russia. We're in a proxy war with Russia, at least, um, and um, that seems to not have um, you know drawn the attention of U.S. authorities. So I'm curious as to why, uh, you know, we allow Telegram in the country, uh, we allow RT in this country. RT is clearly a propaganda, uh, you know, propagandistic uh, uh, service, but we allow it. Telegram is actually quite popular in the United States. And it has very obscure origins and very obscure uh, operations. Um, you know, tell me someone who has visited uh, the Telegram headquarters or the engineering teams, et cetera. Um, you know, there's uh, almost, it's, it's a total mystery. Mm -hmm. So we, there is a, a, a kind of, and uh, there are um, uh, citizens from all over the world, which have research teams all over the world, um, and who knows, for, for an American a citizen or a foreign citizen of those co companies, what their loyalties are. So now you, if you're worried about exfiltration of data, um, there's a hypothetical story you can tell about all of them. Um, and that's the problem with this approach. I can tell you, and this is what I've finally concluded about computer scientists. Computer scientists tend to function in the realms of proofs uh, and mathematical certainties, and there is no mathematical certainty. Now, cybersecurity is much more about managing risks and assessing risks, and I think that is the appropriate approach here. Such an interesting analysis. I could tell you that uh, you mentioned RT, and and in fact, Canada did move to remove RT from our cables, our cable and satellite broadcast system, still available over the internet, but not available through that. And that came uh, immediately after 
uh, the attack uh, on Ukraine, but many of the other kinds of apps are available. You know, when, when you go through that analysis and you highlight the parallels that exist between such a wide range of uh, uh, services, and then we see that it's this single service, enormously popular service, but the single service that that draws so much attention. You know, how much of this do you think is is about economic nationalism as opposed to about the the underlying security issues that the fact that this is a chinese app that has become this this behemoth so to speak in terms of how popular it's become well i think it's pretty clear that um facebook sees and google see tiktok as a major threat amazon sees tiktok as a major threat so you have economic interests in the united states that are um that would be happy to see it Banned. Um, and by the way, I, I just want to point out that many of the sponsors of this bill uh, say that describing it as a possible ban is misinformation. Um, I saw a reporter say to Cho Chu that when he described it as a ban, that's misinformation. Now, here's the reality the bill itself says it will be banned, TikTok will be banned if it doesn't divest. So there's two options in the bill. There may be a divestiture option, but that option may not be available to ByteDance, and it may also prove to be a very unattractive option generally. Let me explain. Um, the Chinese government in 2020, during the course of the Trump uh, efforts to terminate the company or force its sale, um, modified its export controls to include to include algorithms. And many have assumed that that is an indication that they would exercise a veto should ByteDance seek to sell TikTok to an American company. Um, and we see similar reporting today in 2024, that um, early indications from China are that it's told ByteDance that it would forbid a sale. Now you might ask, why would it forbid a sale? Why lose ByteDance a huge amount of money? First of all, I wanna remind you that much of the ownership of this company is not Chinese. The beneficial owners of this company, many of which are American investors, okay, huge private equity investments in ByteDance from American companies. So whatever the loss is to ByteDance is not necessarily a loss to Chinese, uh, the Chinese economy generally, uh, because much of ByteDance is owned abroad, um, including uh, by American hedge funds, American private equity, I should say. Uh, second, this is the one time that China's internet companies have made a massively popular social media app. Uh, and it may be, it may want to uh, not give away that power to the Americans. And it may say essentially, hey, operate outside the United States. It's a whole big world out there, but we don't, you can just shut off American operations. That is in fact what TikTok did in India. It shut off operations in India. Um, and so there is precedent for ByteDance just shutting the operations down rather than selling to an Indian company. Now, why might you do that? Well, you've, uh, you risk having two apps called TikTok, one that operates in Canada and another that's owned totally differently by, by a company in the United States. Um, and then uh, you risk having uh, those apps be effectively becoming competitors with each other. Uh, and so uh, now perhaps it would sell all of the rest of the world outside China to a TikTok entity run by the United States, uh, which I think should alarm much of the rest of the world. Do they really only want apps coming from the United States and the United States uh, effectively uh, blocking 
uh, apps from China from the rest of the world as well. Uh, and so I think there's many reasons here that China might in fact move to block the export of this to the United States, even at the cost of losing uh, the, the funds uh, that would uh, arise from that sale. Okay. All right. That's super interesting. It's tweaked uh, for me. Several questions. First off, um, you, you've highlighted the or started us down the path of what the bill actually contains. Is there anything else that we that we need to know about the bill? I mean, you've highlighted that it's got the the divestiture uh, as one of the options, and absent that, it leads to the ban. Is there anything else in the bill that people ought to know about? Sure. Um, so there's there's an interesting term in the bill, which is um, it is a foreign controlled app a foreign controlled company. Um, and uh, the so TikTok is declared uh, uh, a foreign controlled company. Why? Not because it is um, run by or a state-owned entity. It, it's rather that it has a, a kind of uh, headquarters in Beijing and is therefore subject to presumably to Beijing's uh, orders. That's so the, and I think that some people have assumed in this in in this in this description that the the fact that it's controlled means that there's some actual control ex beyond the fact that it's regulated by um, the parent company is regulated by. It's actually actively managed by uh, the, uh, the foreign country. This would mean, by the way, uh, that uh, the United that all American apps are U.S. controlled apps. So Meta's apps across the world, Google search across the world, is a U.S. controlled search, a U.S. controlled social media platform. Um, and that is a framing that I think American platforms would resist, um, that, that maybe they're controlled for certain purposes in the sense of regulated for certain purposes, but the word controlled uh, suggests an, a kind of measure of daily control or interference in activities that we haven't seen evidence of. Now, I know that some people will point to uh, the special investment, uh, the golden share held in the particular Chinese entity that runs Daoyin, uh, the TikTok sister company. Uh, but that's not uh, in the corporate org chart. Uh, that entity doesn't sit atop TikTok's uh, platform in the United States. Uh, and so, so just uh, just a kind of um, a point there. So first, just a kind of observation about the language of the bill. It's not language I've seen elsewhere, um, and it can be heavily misleading. Um, I'm not saying it's intended to be, but it just has the has the result of being misleading. Second, the statute, if it's passed also authorizes uh, the executive to declare other apps to be uh, uh, to be uh, uh, threats to US national security if they collect um, if they have a million users um, and which and allow sharing of information. Um, it has an exclusion for for sites that are principally reviews. Um, it's, which is kind of weird because the question is whether or not Temu and Sheen could also fall under this uh, the, the statute's prohibitions uh, and be required to divest. Um, and it's uh, there's an open question as to whether or not they are would potentially be subject to exclusion. So essentially, any app that comes from a handful of countries that are that are the adversary countries uh, for purposes of this, uh, this bill. Uh, so it allows for additional apps to be designated. So this isn't, it doesn't stop with TikTok. It's not just TikTok in that sense. It singles out TikTok. It says, we've already made this determination with respect to TikTok, 
But now the president can, uh, the executive can make additional determinations with respect to other popular apps and popular hair, meaning a uh, million or more users uh, who are empowered to share information through that app. I wasn't aware that the this extended potentially beyond just TikTok. Now, these kinds of bans extend beyond just the United States. You mentioned India for as as one example where TikTok basically who the response was, okay, we'll pick up and just leave. We know there are any number of other countries that have done something similar, um, where they've put they've either tried to remove the app or put certain sort of regs in place. Do you do you have concerns that if this comes to pass, this provides a bit of a model where we begin to see this sort of splinter net in a cer in certain respects where countries become far more aggressive about banning certain apps, whether from adversaries for security purposes or even for some of the economic reasons that we've been discussing. So what do what does the rest of the world want? It wants the benefits of digital technologies, digital information services. But it would love to have those run by its own companies. So what you would like is a kind of import substitution, to borrow the 20th century uh, uh, phrase, for digital services. That's exactly what this bill does. This bill says, we're not going to ban TikTok. That's the hope, okay? We want it to just become American and be owned by Americans. We want Americans to benefit from the amazing technology that is TikTok, the amazing community that is TikTok, but we want it under American owners. That's a win-win proposition. Any politician, would be thrilled if that landed on his or her lap. Imagine Canadian, you know, you know, politicians. Wouldn't they be pleased if they could just say, now it's Google Canada, and now you can Google to your heart's content, but it's now uh, Bell Canada that owns Google Canada. Uh, this is the kind of ideal that many uh, jurisdictions across the world want. And it's a great precedent that may turn out to haunt American companies. Um, because why? The America, America has just told you that if an app is based somewhere else, it's then a foreign controlled app. And that means that whenever that country wants, says, hey, we want the data from the app, it can say, bloop, and suck it all up. That's not the way that these things actually work in reality. Um, uh, but that is what the United States will have just told the rest of the world. Um, that if you now use an American app, that means that the US government can suck it all up. And by the way, now you're left with, oh, you know, you'll have questions about, oh, what about due process rights and uh, rights, et cetera. Well, what are the due process rights of foreigners abroad? Um, it, you know, I'm not. You know, you'll find you'll find that those questions, you know, to be uh, quite ones that will bring a, a, a sweat on the brow of uh, American technology companies. Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's right. It's a really great way to to put it. Now, speaking of establishing precedents. This isn't the first piece of U.S. legislation that's tried to do this. You mentioned the Montana bill. Can you talk a bit about how that bill fared once it once it reached the courts and, and whether you think should this become law, we might see a similar kind of challenge? Yeah. So what you saw in Montana, and you'll see a similar challenge uh, with this. I think TikTok is already must be just getting ready to file for an immediate injunction must be finding uh, users who will serve as plaintiffs in, in uh, cases. So what you saw were um, a set of cases consolidated uh, where TikTok users and TikTok itself sued largely on the, based on the First Amendment uh, to say, hey, look, this um, uh, proposed ban, which, is going, which would have taken effect on January 1st, 2024 in Montana, 
should not go into effect. The district judge heard Montana's argument um, and ultimately sided with uh, the users and TikTok uh, and um, enjoined the the uh, the bill from going into effect, the the statute from going into effect. Um, now that case uh, continues on, so it's just a preliminary injunction. So we'll have further uh, you know, uh, uh, rulings in that case, um, and and uh, so the Montana is continuing to fight that case. Uh, so so we'll see. By the way, in that case, the users were Montanans. Um, but their legal bills were paid by TikTok. Uh, and that was also the case in a 2020 uh, uh, lawsuit brought by, which what I love was influencers. Uh, and so, so influencers on TikTok sued um, in, in the case of Marlon v. Uh, 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 Trump um, in 2020, um, uh, and uh, Marlon being one of the influencers, TikTok influencers, and the court there recognized influencing as a proper First Amendment protected activity, uh, and so which I which I love as well. So, uh, 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 Michael, you could be recognized as an influencer in the United States uh, and uh, have your uh, uh, by by the courts. So, what we'll see is a similar response in the United States. Um, you know, users and uh, and TikTok uh, suing on the First Amendment, uh, also on due process grounds, uh, maybe bill of attainder, uh, which will raise uh, uh, interesting questions as well. Okay, interesting. Yeah, you know, why, why don't we wrap with this? That you're suggesting that that's where things may head should the bill become this legislation become law. Can you give me a sense of where do you see things going? If we're, if we're back sometime in the future talking about the situation with TikTok, uh, what's the likelihood that this piece of legislation does in fact pass the Senate and and, and become law? You've talked about the prospect of uh, litigation that, that may challenge that. And I guess more broadly, you know, you've sketched out uh, a, a world in which we may begin to start to see countries begin to say, hey, we want the benefits of these apps uh, but we want to have greater levels of control. Is that, do you think, where we we are headed? Well, I don't mind greater levels of control over the app. So, for example, if we passed a U.S. comprehensive privacy bill, that would give us greater levels of control. Um, by the way, it is illegal for TikTok, even under the current law, to pass information to foreign governments. And that was very much the heart of the questions under the USA Cloud Act. And the executive agreements that have been uh, you know, entered into there under, uh, and so um, where there's no executive agreement with Canada, even by the way, which is which is uh, uh, which tells you how sad our processes are and how ridiculous our processes are on those fronts. Um, but uh, uh, so the I so I think there's lots of reasons to want greater control. What I disagree with is insisting on ownership. Um, and even seeing ownership as the hallmark of foreign influence. Um, you know, so American investors have huge stakes in Chinese companies. Does that mean that we control those companies? Um, and um, so ByteDance uh, would be in a very difficult position if it is faced with contradictory commands, one from under Chinese law and one under U.S. law. Um, but if that happens, then I think, you know, it would be, uh, uh, it would cause uh, enormous, uh, you know, problems for ByteDance. And by the way, ByteDance employees, many of whom, and TikTok employees, many of whom have uh, communicated with uh, newspapers and reporters uh, on an ongoing basis. So TikTok, as far as I can tell, leaks like a sieve. Uh, and so uh, it, this would all have to be done without any employee actually noting what happened. I should also just quickly mention Project Texas, a huge elaborate effort by uh, TikTok to localize data, to put it under an Oracle cloud, subject its algorithm to scrutiny by Oracle engineers and other third-party auditors. So enormous effort. So in some sense, TikTok is the most heavily scrutinized app on your phone. Uh, and so just another thing to kind of think about in this context. Um, so, so I think we're going to see 
I think this is going to end up in the courts. I kind of think that um, if I were a betting man, I would say the Senate passes because the in in the halls of D.C. where I live, you know, the kind of it's very easy to paint China as this great menace that's going to, um, uh, you know, somehow use our TikTok data and uh, and attack us or something. I'm not sure exactly what. Um, and and hold us hostage in some way. Uh, and uh, so I think those are, um, I, I'm, you know, uh, so like I said, I've heard so many accounts, uh, uh, you know, uh, hyperventilating about the national security threat from TikTok um, that uh, I kind of think that uh, its days uh, uh, are numbered uh, in some sense, except that you will have the US courts that will ask the U.S. government to present the evidence to justify what is really a very substantial interference with American speech rights. Uh, and so um, that's really ultimately going to be uh, TikTok's end users' hope um, in this battle. All right. Well, I mean, it's going to be fascinating to see the, the way it plays out. I mean, it's sort of that end game of going to the courts where you have Perhaps a whole series of well-known TikTok influencers being part of that litigation. I certainly certainly will increase maybe the entertainment value, but with with real world concerns. And I know that from a Canadian perspective, as I mentioned, we've already seen governments move to ban the app. There's been discussions about security reviews here as well. And so uh, I suspect, and I think many suspect that what however this plays out in the United States, Canada may well follow. So I think it, I think the impact and implications of what happens in the United States really do spread to a wide range of countries, not just the United States. You know, I there's, there's so much here and you've done just an amazing job of uh, breaking it all down. So, so thanks for taking the time and joining me on the podcast. Thanks so much, Michael. It's, uh, it's such a great podcast. Honored to be invited back. That's the Law Bites podcast for this week. If you have comments, suggestions, or other feedback, write to lawbites at pobox.com. Follow the podcast on Twitter at lawbitespod or Michael Geist at mgeist. You can download the latest episodes from my website at michaelgeist.ca or subscribe via RSS at Apple Podcast, Google, or Spotify. The Law Bites podcast is produced by Gerardo LeBron LeBoy. Music by the LeBoy brothers, Gerardo and Jose LeBron LeBoy. Credit information for the clips featured in this podcast can be found in the show notes for this episode at michaelgeist.ca. I'm Michael Geist. Thanks for listening, and see you next time.